Hey guys, welcome. Thank you all for getting up early on a Saturday morning. It is Saturday, right? Yes. yes. And um, for braving the cold that I think just got here, we brought it yesterday. And we stopped for gas just outside of town and we could feel it changing. So uh, I guess all we got to do though is make it through today and tomorrow and then we can leave it with you. <laughs> Next day it'll be in Missouri. All right, so, you know, this morning I am going to share with you some stuff that it, it really concerns me, quite honestly, because it's so fantastic, it's so sensational that I usually shy away from this kind of stuff. You've seen these guys, these radio and TV preachers that, you know, they chase the latest fad and, yeah, they found the chariots of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea and... You get these fuzzy pictures and nothing ever shows up in some technical magazine, you know? Nothing's peer reviewed. There's nothing that, no artifacts that they bring back. I'm talking about the Ron Wyatt kind of Vindal Jones uh, or his, his knockoff Indiana Jones, you know, that kind of stuff. But this is, usually things that are too good to be true are. You know that well enough now, right? You've been around the block a few times. This one is, has just amazed me as I've dug down into the material on it. But I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna stop teasing and we're gonna start studying. If you got your Bible or something to take notes on, feel free to do this. But my goal for you, this is gonna get really technical and really geeky really quick. For that, I apologize, but not really. Uh, what I want you to do to survive this is just kind of get the flyover, to just get the, the basic gist of what it is that we're going to do. We're going to delve into the area of not just Bible interpretation and archaeology and even geography, but into things like meteorology and metallurgy, okay? and it is gonna get really nerdy. Don't let it geek you out. Just uh, get the big picture and we'll do some summary stuff, but I want you to have the chance to interact with some material that was published in a, um, in a, a trade magazine called Nature. Have you ever heard of Nature? It's pretty, it gets pretty nerdy, doesn't it? It gets down into the weeds really quick, all right? So, because this is not a Christianity Today kind of magazine. Uh, it's not even a Bible magazine. So, um, we're going to be talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and its destruction. And because of the social issues and trends that we have going on in our world, in our country today, it will be, irrespective of the geekiness and the nerdiness, it will be incredibly relevant to you and to your family and to your community. Uh, you can end up doing the math on this, but the point is that when human beings conduct themselves in a certain way, God will respond in a certain way. And these things are... Uh, consistent and therefore predictable and we pretty much he doesn't leave us with a whole lot of coin flipping or you know um, jump ball kind of things with respect to what he expects of us so let's look at the passage that we're going to be addressing today and it comes to, to us in uh, Genesis 19 and then another text in Deuteronomy that refers back to Genesis 19 The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire <coughs> from Yahweh out of heaven, came from up above. He overthrew those cities and all of the valley, all of the valley, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and, listen to this, what grew on the ground. What grew on the ground, keep... Put a book note, a bookmarker there. 
Now Abraham looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he saw, and behold, smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Thus, when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Now let's look at that passage in Deuteronomy 29. All of its land is brimstone and salt. This is a reference to where somebody lives who has disrespected God and gone off and worshiped false gods and ignored, left behind the covenant God of Israel. All its land of this person is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and productive. You remember that? Uh, what grew on the ground, right? Okay, Deuteronomy is back there. A burning waste, unsown and unproductive, and no grass grows in it. I mean, the Bible's going to great extent, you know, great lengths to get the point across that this is uninhabitable and, and land and that can't uh, uh, support any real agriculture. No grass grows in it. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim. This is, this is a, an analogy. A person who walks away from God and pursues the worship of other gods in his life, that person's land is going to become this, which is like Sodom and Gomorrah. So we have a template, Sodom and Gomorrah, and now the uh, author of Deuteronomy, Moses, is saying, this is going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. The article is by, a, an, article, uh, by a, an author named uh, Ted Bunch, B-U-N-C-H, and a whole bunch of other people, about 20 different authors. And it uh, represents the uh, about nine years of of excavating and analysis by multiple universities, research universities with archaeology departments associated. The title of the article is A tunguska Size Airburst Destroyed Tal. That's another way of pronouncing the Arabic word tell, like Tel Aviv. It's an artificial mound built up by successive layers of human occupation over centuries and centuries. Destroyed Tal el Hamam, a Middle Bronze Age city, that's the time of Abraham, uh, in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea. This was just published in September. We're talking a couple of months ago. So this is more or less front page recent news. There is a website below that you can't make out all that well and it won't let you change the color, you know? Pardon? Okay, well, you're better there. If you want to write it down, feel free, but I'm getting ready to change the slide. I always leave my stuff behind, so if you want it, you, you can have it. Pastor and uh, the other uh, folks on staff, they'll have access to this. So, Let's look at the big picture first, and then we're going to home in on this Tal El Hamam, or Tel El Hamam, if that sounds better to you. All right, so we're going to get our bearings first. Here's the Mediterranean Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea. This is Israel, and this is the kingdom of Jordan today, all right? Uh, dial in closer. This is Jerusalem. This is Jericho, 16 miles to the east. And if you cross the valley just north of Bethany beyond the Jordan, where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, Bethany beyond the Jordan is a New Testament site. We're going to be looking at a site that is not even an Old Testament period site. It's an Abrahamic period site. It goes back to what is called the MBA or Middle Bronze Age, and we're talking somewhere around 1750 B.C., 1750 years before the birth of Jesus. 
and it's just above Bethany, right about there. It's almost directly, almost due east of Jericho, five miles further east and on the Jordanian side of the Jordan River, not on the Israeli side. All right, this is uh, courtesy of Google Maps, and I provided the extra stuff that looks poorly done, all right? Google did well, I'm okay. This is the north shore of the Dead Sea right here. This, I uh, colored it in blue, this is the channel of the lower Jordan River that dumps into the Dead Sea right there on the northern edge, on the northern shoreline. So far, so good? Okay, all right. Just to get your bearings again, up here in the hill country is Jerusalem. Then you have about 15, 16 miles of wilderness, of just dry, uninhabited, and um, uncultivatable land. And then you come to this valley, very wide, and five miles wide in some places, including the one that we're going to be dealing with, the, the Lower Jordan Valley, where the Lower Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. Uh, here's Qumran. Those of you who have been there with us before or with somebody else, you remember. Okay, so this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered right here. All right, here's Jericho, this whole oasis right here, the big green blob where there's actually vegetation because of some springs. You may remember in 2 Kings, the spring of Elisha. He threw meal into the spring and the water becomes, became sweet. Okay, that's Jericho, the oasis city of Jericho. Directly across, or almost directly across, five miles across this big wide chunk of the Jordan Valley is this Ar-Rada, Ar-Rada. And it is uh, near the city that we're going to be dis discussing uh, today, this morning. It's called Tal el Hammam in Arabic. For another way of triangulating its location, we were, weren't we in February at Mount Nebo? Okay, all right, Mount Nebo is right here where I've circled. It's just above the northern shore of the Dead Sea, el, uh, Nebo, right here. It's pretty close. In fact, the people who... Um, are excavating typically stay at Madaba and they bust down to excavate every day at Tal El Hammam. All right, now we're going to do a real short video. For the last year or so, I've been working with a company out of Amarillo, Texas, and we have been um, working on videos from airplanes, helicopters, and drones to illustrate biblical locations. And it's been my responsibility to identify all of those and index it so that it can be word or phrase searched and people can eventually use this as an archive to preach and teach Bible stuff. So where we are right now is, you can see this really wide valley. We're right over top of a very wide valley. You can see that or no? This is that five mile wide, lower Jordan Valley, just above the Dead Sea, which is just off of your picture on the right-hand side. This area right here, these are the outskirts of that oasis called Jericho. So we're on the Israeli side, and we're looking across at the Jordanian side. Here you can see the channel of the lower Jordan River. Can you trace it with my finger there? Lower Jordan River, all right? This is the road where you bypass uh, Jericho if you're not going in. And when you get here, if you turn left, you go toward Qumran and the northern shore of the Dead Sea, okay? Uh, what else do I need to say? Uh, oh, before we get, it's very hazy because it's always really hazy due to the evaporation that's going on in that area. It's always hazy, so I apologize for the uh, poverty of uh, the visual, but it is what it is. This is the best I could come up with. So directly across from uh, Jericho here, if we go straight across, Tal el Hammam is right there. 
Now I'm going to put it in motion and you can do with it what you want to do. You know all the places. Right up above here, this is Perea or beyond the Jordan in the New Testament. And it is uh, Ammon and Reuben in the, New T in the Old Testament. So here's Jericho right here. So Tal El Hamam is back over here, five miles from this oasis city of Jericho. Here's the Tel or the ancient city of Jericho that was conquered by Joshua. It's about 17, almost 18 acres in size. And then this is Wadi Kilt. It's called the, it's the, in the Bible, the Jerusalem Jericho Road. You follow that uh, drainage system and you can, you just keep it on your right and you go from Jerusalem to Jericho. There's an old Roman, part of an old Roman road that's still there connecting Jerusalem and Jericho. This is the, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan context. The man went from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Okay? This is, on, from the Jordanian side, this is Tal El Hamam right here. All this in the foreground. You can see the Jordan Valley out behind. And then this little green blob right here, that's Jericho. This is the Judean wilderness. And if you go 15, 16 miles, keep going west, you get to Jerusalem and Bethel and I uh, and uh, Bethlehem. All right. So there you have it. Jericho, Tal El Hamam, the Jordan Valley, and I think you're set. Here's the Dead Sea. That'll show you how close Tal El Hamam is to the Dead Sea. Anybody see that? If you need to adjust lighting or something like that, please feel free. We won't be reading too much except off the screen. Okay, Tal El Hamam right here in the uh, foreground. And you can see that there's agriculture that's actually going on now around Tal El Hamam. We'll talk about that more. Important discoveries. Once 1750 to all the way down to about 1650, radiocarbon dating, um, for the next 600 years, this gigantic city that is more than 89 walled acres, which is five times larger than Jericho and about 16 times larger than the Jerusalem of King David. It's a gigantic city for the Middle Bronze Age. The only thing that I can think of that even comes close is Hazor, which is like, I don't know, it's like a, a, a week's journey north. It's north of the Sea of Galilee, and it's about 200 acres. That was the greatest city in the Middle Bronze Age in the days of, um, uh, in the days of Abraham. Okay? So a 600-year absence of anybody living there or anybody trying to do agriculture anywhere around there. Now, this, this area has been inhabited by human beings since the Neolithic age. 30 meter thick mud brick or to all the way down to four meter, which is a meter is a step. It's a yard-ish. Walls, towers, and gates. Almost all pulverized and blown to the northeast. Just little stubs of walls and towers and gates sticking out of the ground once they've been excavated. Now, not due to erosion. You saw how high that tell or tall was from where the little rivulets that run on the north and south side. There you have things like, that's, you, almost, you never get this anywhere else in this, uh, in this country, these countries, or in the rest of the world. Mud brick, you know, like the bricks that people were building, that the Israelites were building the, the, the store cities of Pharaoh in Egypt, mud brick that has been melted. Melted mud brick. Not eroded mud brick. Melted. There is a, there is, it, it turns to, the, it, the top of it turns to glass. 
So it's glass, it's, it's encased in its own glass. The mud brick is melted into glass. And melted pottery, melted pottery. What do you do to make pottery strong? You fire it. But if you turned the heat up like three times hotter, that the outside of that pottery vessel would begin to melt. So you have actual pot, pieces of pottery that have been melted on the outside, but not on the inside. You have salination. The reason for this gap, 600 year gap at Tal El Hamam, is due to the fact that they couldn't do agriculture. The reason they couldn't do agriculture is because the soil was too saline to support crops for over 600 years. The melted mud brick on the mud, on, the, uh, uh, on the mud brick has bubbles in it. Partially melted roofing clay, melted bil- building plaster. I just want you to just, in, in your mind, we cook at about 350 degrees. Ladies, help me out here. Thank you very much. Okay, we cook at about 350 degrees. How much hotter would you have to make your oven at home you put a piece of plaster in there. That, that, how much hotter would you have to make that oven before that, that plaster or that pottery or that mud brick would melt? Check this out down at the bottom. Shocked quartz grains. It means that you've got little fissures in the, sho- in the, in the quartz, little cracks, little micro cracks in the quartz rock that are known from other air burst, that's a new word for for me, it might be a new word for you, but it's when a comet or an asteroid or a meteor or a meteorite enters the surface of a planet that has an atmosphere and the pressure and the friction, it becomes so superheated that it ends up exploding. That's an air burst. Carbonized pieces of wood beams, partially diamondized, charred grain, and limestone cobbles, you know where you cobblestone street, that have been turned into chalk. A destruction matrix or context, this is highly unusual. We know of only a handful worldwide where these phenomena are observable very much atypical, non-standard of any of the other archaeological strata throughout the ancient Near East, Israel or outside of Israel. All of, this, all of this data points to a catastrophic, and these are words that I have copied and pasted straight out of the article. These are not my words. You know I don't talk like this, right? I speak fluent redneck, but not fluent scientific all point to a catastrophic cosmic high temperature event. You've got there at Tal El Hamam radiocarbon datable material that dates to 1750 ish. That's the time of Abraham. That's kind of the middle of the Middle Bronze Age, right in the sweet spot. Abraham, Lot, Sarah, and the like. I want to talk to you just a little bit about human remains, and I want you to think about judgment. Because this is, when you read the, the scientific record, the archaeological record, it just sounds like a catastrophic judgment context. Only about a dozen pieces of skeletons, no complete skeletons, have been found in this entire city that housed over 60,000 people. Not one complete skeleton. About a dozen partial skeletons have been discovered. And when the joints are intact, and there are only a few of those, you know, like an elbow or a knee, they are all hyperextended. It's like they have been blown apart, but not enough to be separated. Everybody else has been separated. Just a a couple of dozen examples, 
and these are almost disarticulated, disconnected from one another. All other bone fragments were pulverized, and th these are direct quotes, had microscopic rare earth minerals and salt melted into and embedded in the bone. About that. Where do most rare earth minerals come from? Somewhere else. No evidence of military action. One arrowhead, zero spearheads, zero swords. In other words, no, this could not have happened as a result of some sort of a, a military action, an invasion, a, 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 a major siege. The ends of the bones that were found intact, and I've given you a couple of pictures. One is a foot with, a, a leg, with leg bones and a knee joint still intact. This is a piece of a rib. The ends of the bones are charred and have metal splatter embedded in the bone along with salt. One, and only one, partial skeleton was found in the same kind of posture, and you've seen pictures on National Geographic and the Discovery Channel and stuff of the, uh, the, the ruins of Pompeii, where, uh, a case where Mount Vesuvius uh, was uh, erupted in AD 79, and people are in defensive postures. They're trying to protect their face and head. So only one of the 60,000 or so original inhabitants and uh, that is only a partial skeleton as well. We propose, and this is a direct quote, and this is where it gets kind of nerdy too, so I don't have any pictures for a while. Uh, Dr. Pepper or coffee, I recommend, <laughs> if you're struggling at this point. I want you, the reason I want to read this stuff is I want you to interact with the original, not, not my, you know, summation, of or dumbing down or whatever, I want you to read the original words of the original excavators. We propose that the individuals represented by the bones were violently torn apart by a powerful air burst or impact. They haven't been able to find a crater. So they're thinking, unless it's underneath the water of the Dead Sea, that there is no crater. In other words, the, the, whatever came into our atmosphere disintegrated at some point and is only found in microscopic things like leaving um, violently torn apart by a, a, an air burst, leaving a few, a few hand and foot bones still articulated and unbroken. It would not be possible to duplicate these injuries and disperse the bones as found in this layer by warfare or accidental falls from a great height, for example, off of the rampart, off the, the, the most heavily fortified part of the city, the, quote, upper city. Although tornadoes can cause bone breakage, organ damage, and disarticulation, they're exceedingly rare in Jordan and Israel and don't usually get as strong as the kind of tornadoes that we see here in the Midwest. Exceedingly rare and typically of low intensity. In any event, no known tornado has been able to, sh been shown to burn bones or to break them into small fragments, both of which we get at Tal el Hamam. Continued quote, based on the description, the distribution of human bones on the upper and lower, upper city where the intelligentsia, the aristocrats are living and then the commoners are living in the lower city, we propose the force of a high temperature, debris laden, high velocity blast wave from an air burst impact. And listen to this, how it describes what's left of these people uh, as, as discovered by the archeologist. Incinerated and flayed their exposed flesh decapitated and dismembered some individuals, shattered many bones into mostly centimeter-sized fragments. That's mostly what you get. It's an exception. There's approximately a dozen pieces of partial skeleton. Scattered their bones across several meters and then buried in this kind of like a sandblast that came next, 
buried the bones in the destruction layer and charred or disintegrated any bones that were still exposed like up on top of the ground. Missiles would be continued, quote, missiles would be capable of incinerating and stripping flesh and crushing bones. Current evidence suggests that the human mortality rate at Tel El Hamam or Tal El Hamam was very high so that most likely none of the 8,000, and they're only talking about the upper city. The lower city would have another 42 to 52,000 people living in it. That none of, no one survived. Nobody. The circumstances and conditions of the human bones and fragments suggest that at the time of death, these individuals were going about their normal activities. They were out baking bread or they were working in the fields or they were making pottery or whatever it was that they happened to be keeping kids. Uh, and they were struck by a high temperature thermal pulse. It just came out of nowhere. It just happened. And in a matter of seconds, four to five seconds, that entire civilization was gone, done. It was followed by a hypervelocity blast wave from a catastrophic cosmic airburst. This event was most likely larger than the airburst at Tunguska, Siberia that happened in 1908. Do you know anything about this? I'd heard of it. I'd only heard the word Tunguska. Now it's part of my working vocabulary. There, there was a, one of these cosmic airbursts in the lifetime of some people that are, you know, only recently passed away, where 500 reindeer and several herders within the blast radius suffered severe burns on their bodies and were killed, and, but didn't suffer articul disarticulation. All of that does happen at Tal El Hamam. So they, they think that this Tunguska airburst up in Russia, northern Russia, was, you know, this Tal El Hamam was like five times more intense than this Tunguska situation that is very studied by the scientific community. We have melted rare earth minerals, and I want you to look at the degree at which melting begins to occur. Platinum melted at Tal El Hamam. 3,214 degrees Fahrenheit. They give it all in Celsius. I've translated it all. Thank God for the internet. I want you to look at this iridium. I didn't know it existed. I still don't know what iridium is. But these guys brought in uh, expert metallurgists. They did all kinds of testing. They did all kinds of surveying of literature that has been done previously and reported on at what temperature do these various rare earth metals begin to melt. Iridium melts at 44, almost 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit. How many times more, how many times hotter is 4,500 degrees than your oven? 350 is what we usually cook at. Ruthenium, palladium, I'm not a metallurgist, so a lot of this stuff I've never even heard of. Iron, I know about like Iron Age, titanium, iron sulfide, etc. Zircon crystals, melting point, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, melted. Plenty of examples of that at Tal El Hamam. Chromite, 4,100 degrees Fahrenheit is the beginning of melting. And there you see this uh, kind of striation, these micro cracks. Uh, like you see also here in quartz. This shocked phenomenon. So, are, are there shocked quartz? Has that been found in other places? Um, yeah, at Tunguska. Look at how many trillion pounds of TNT it would take to create another Tunguska. That's how this is measured, is by the megatons or the amount of, um, of TNT required to reproduce. Socorro, New Mexico. This is where the um, atomic bomb uh, experiments were taking place at the, toward the end of World War II. Kazakhstan is where in 49 and 53, Russia was doing the same thing, pursuing the uh, atomic uh, bomb. 
And in all of these instances, what happened at Tal el Hamam far eclipses all of these experiments and naturally occurring uh, destructions. Melted quartz grains. When, quor when does quartz begin to melt? Right around 3,000, 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Melted quartz grains. Not just shocked, but also melted in some examples from Tal el Hamam. Examples of pottery. This, um, uh, this article gives extensive, extensive pictures under incredibly high magnification. And they provide it right there. You can get this even if you've got Wi-Fi. You can get it before you leave the room today. This is not something that's squirreled away, hidden away just for specialists, for scientists, for other forms of eggheads. You can look at this yourself. Melted pottery. When does pottery begin to melt? Around 27, 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. Examples of melted mud brick. Mud brick begins to melt at about 2300 degrees. Melted roofing clay. Plenty of examples. Almost 3000 degrees required to melt that roofing material, much of which was plant-based. Turned it into glass. Melting couldn't have taken place as a result of right, uh, lightning strikes in this situation. Why? Because when lightning strikes a place and uh, melts stuff and uh, shocks stuff, it will leave a certain amount of mag magnetization. This doesn't have that. It doesn't match lightning strike type stuff. Besides that, it would take a lot of lightning strikes to completely destroy, pulverize 89 acres of territory. No melted material was found in the city earlier, like before this time period, 1750, 1650 BC, or later in time, even on the way, all the way up into Roman times. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about a little bit about the impact on the um, surrounding area. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to quote them. Numerous lines of evidence revealed that the sudden catastrophic destruction of Tel el Hammam at around 1650, 1750, at the same time, archaeologists excavating nearby sites noticed what they termed the Late Bronze Age gap. After this Middle Bronze destruction, Late Bronze comes in, and there were 16 towns and cities, including Tal el Hammam, and 100 smaller villages in this general area were abandoned for hundreds of years in this 30, in this 30 kilometer wide lower Jordan Valley. This abandonment continued the entire Late Bronze Age and most of the early Iron Age. You know, the Israelites did not have to destroy this city when they crossed the plain of the Jordan and attacked Jericho. There's no biblical account of anything in this area except Jericho, right? Remember Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls? Okay, it doesn't t say Tal el Hamam. It doesn't give any other uh, location, only Jericho. This abandonment continued for... Late Bronze Age, the Iron Age, population levels plummeted from 60,000 people to only a few hundred nomadic tribes people inhabiting this area after the destruction event. Uh, the occupation and agriculture gap, that's 600 years. At Tal el Hammam, 600 years. At Jericho, which is five miles away, 300 years. And there's a place just a little bit further north from Tal el Hammam called Tal Nimrin. I don't know that it's mentioned in the Bible. We can't really associate it with a specific Bible location. Maybe it was Zeboim. Maybe it was Adma, one of those other places. It, it could have been Gomorrah. We, we don't know. We can't connect name, modern name with ancient name. Five kilometers north of Tal el Hammam, uh, about 500 year gap in inhabitation and agriculture. 
This multi-century, quoting, multi-century abandonment is particularly puzzling given that this area contains the most fertile agricultural land within a radius of hundreds of kilometers. You've got to get to Jerusalem before it's this fertile again. Or up into the area of Amman, Jordan to the east, capital of the kingdom of Jordan today. The destruction was so remarkable and so pervasive that the ensuing name of this area became Avel. Avel in Hebrew means a time of intense mourning over some catastrophic calamity. This doesn't appear to have been some typical disaster that occasionally occurred due to warfare and earthquakes. Instead, it appears to have been a regional, check this out, I had to underline this. I put the underlining in. Everything else is original. A regional civilization ending catastrophe that depopulated more than 500 square kilometers of the southern Jordan Valley for between three and seven centuries. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is significant. That's somebody putting the hammer down. An air burst above the Dead Sea would have dispersed the content of this, area, this 34% saline of the Dead Sea for miles, specifically toward the north, toward Jericho, and the northeast toward Tal El Hamam and Tal Nimrin. This would cause the salinization of this rich and well-watered area worse than the Romans sowing with salt of the soil around Carthage at the end of the Peloponnesian War. That is my, those are my words. Everything else is the authors of the article. I'm just kind of summarizing here and then drawing a comparison to what the Romans did at the end of the Peloponnesian War to the area around Carthage. The three largest urban, this is back to them, this is not me. The three largest urban uh, cities in the southern Jordan Valley, that is Tal El Hammam, Jericho, and Tal Nimrin, burned and were destroyed simultaneously around the same, at the same time, at the time of Abraham. But lack evidence of military action, all of this stuff, and as a potential cause. Also, you have to rule out lightning, you have to rule out earthquakes and stuff, and they did the work on that. So this is a, a graphic on what it would have looked like. This is the edge of the, the, the northern edge of the Dead Sea. Jericho would be about right here. Uh, Tal Nimrin would be about, uh, I'm sorry, Jericho is about right here. Tal Nimrin here. And somewhere right around in here uh, is uh, Tal El Hammam, Tal Nimrin right there. So the extent of the Tunguska airburst, 1908, Siberia, Russia, is in the gray. It's that, that amount. This airburst was about four to five times larger than the Tunguska airburst in the uh, area that it covered and the intensity of it. The authors, and I'm not, I'm, notice I put S apostrophe, those folks that wrote the article, the people who have done the excavating, the metallurgy, the meteorology, the, you know, everything. Their conclusion is there's an ongoing debate as to whether Tal El Hammam could be the biblical city of Sodom, but this issue is beyond the scope of this investigation. Okay, now here's the Wave Nunley redneck version of that. If it walks like one and it quacks like one, it probably is one. Okay, so I'd like to leave you with this thought and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, Psalm 19, the testimony of Yahweh is sure. The Hebrew for that is, and I've written it out in English letters so that you could run with it if you like, ne'emanah, the root of the word, which comes from aleph, mem, nun, is the same word, and you can read it in the English, e M N is the same word as we say amen. It is established. It is solid. It's sure. It's trustworthy. You can take this to the bank. When God says that this event happened in Genesis 19, and it's referenced all over the place. I gave you one example in Deuteronomy 29. It's all over the place. Jesus is even talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. It's still a byword in the first century AD when Jesus is here. Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented long ago if they'd seen the many mighty works that I've done, 
right? Um, this is a, a true, sure, established word. And what we have in our modern day written off as being legendary, as being hyper-exaggerated, uber-exaggerated, this, you know, bedtime story kind of stuff is actually now a part of the geological, archaeological, meteorological, metallurgy record. And I am amazed. What Jesus said in John 17, God's word is truth, is real. Your turn. Yes, sir. something about maybe they think there this particular thing happened there, did you mention that this particular thing happened like a um, something from the sky falling like a meteorite or some sort of uh, that that would have caused such a yes uh, extensive you, destruction did you mention that in this presentation yeah it would have to be a, a, a comet like meteor like asteroid like meteorite like material from above that then entered our atmosphere, and because of the drag caused by an atmosphere, it would have um, heated to the point that it exploded into tiny droplets. But at the same time, it would have to be, they, it, this is all in the article, it'd have to be a certain uh, um, distance from the Dead Sea to have blown part of the northern end of the Dead Sea up onto shore and as far as five miles north of the northern shore of the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is 30, 34% saline. And so that would account for the salinity of the, uh, of the soil, which would account for the 600 and 300, 500 year gaps in, in habitation and agriculture. Yeah, and, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Nunley, you had made it clear, and I, maybe I just didn't hear it, but to help these people understand this isn't just archaeologists that are commenting and have studied this. It's a geologist. And you understand the study of geology and you put, uh, and, and you put all this together, you get a lot of just, you know, brilliant people that are studying from a secular point of view, not trying to make a biblical point. But they have to conclude like th they did because they really don't want to make a biblical point but they're being honest about what they're finding. Which I appreciate yes, very and, much. And so we have some questions and I'll repeat them. Go ahead. Doctor, is there, in the article, is there any mention or reference to any trace materials from a meteor? Yeah, you have stuff that like this iridium and that kind of thing that's not normal on the earth. And you have a concentration of that right here where if you go in other places in Jordan and you're looking for things like titanium and iridium and that sort of thing, you're not going to find it. But no crater. No, they, they've not found a, a crater that they can identify as. Now, almost every year this area floods. So then what happens? You have eroded sediment that would fill a crater up in that five mile wide part of the Jordan Valley. There's a, st a version of a, a story of that in uh, Joshua where that they crossed at flood time. The Jordan River got stopped up during the time when it normally floods. It's in the spring. All right, right here, question. Uh, yeah, how did Lot survive all that? Lot would have gone, if he went toward Hebron where uh, Abraham was, he would be going almost behind the blast. He'd be going southwest, whereas when the blast hit, it hit somewhere around the north shore of the Dead Sea, and all the splatter, not just at Tal el Hamam, but also at Jericho, also at uh, Tal Nimrin, and some of these other villages where they were able to take samples, it was all going toward the northeast. The splatter is going northeastward. All right, Gary Walter. Uh, yeah, Dr. Nunley, um, all of the trace and very rare elements that have been found there, uh, iridium, 
uh, there's a layer of, of iridium all around the world, and, and scientists say that that's, that's what caused the destruction of the dinosaurs uh, with a huge meteor that hit in what we now know as the Gulf of Mexico. Um, just a point uh, about iridium and, and what it is. Yeah, the concentrations, though, of iridium and the fact that this stuff w w uh, only, um, I think it's iridium that's somewhere around 4,000 degrees begins to melt, is actually embedded in human bone. That is, that, that is unknown anywhere, even at Tunguska. is ne totally unknown. Next. This event that happened, was it quick? Do they know? Was Four it to five seconds in length. Oh, okay. These people didn't suffer. Um, at, at least in, on, in this world. Well, if the next world is on them. <laughs> <laughs> well, when that happened, is that when Lot's wife looked back? That would have been, yes. At when that she looked very back time. and turned into salt? Yes. And, at that time with a, a few seconds, whatever happened? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I just wanted to talk about Lot's wife. Like, if you could just talk about how she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Okay, so we have, we have a really interesting word that's used in Hebrew there. The word to look is ra'ah. It's all over the Bible, 500 plus times. This word that is used in, uh, in uh, G Genesis 19, it is that she navat. It's a different word, different verb. And it doesn't mean to glance, like to look. Navat means to gaze or to stare with unbroken, with unbroken gaze at something. In other words, she was constantly looking back. Oh, I wish I remember the days. Oh, I just, I hate leaving my, she couldn't disconnect. And it is that word that Jesus uses when he says, no one putting his hand to the plow and then looking back. It doesn't mean that you're riding down the road and you just think of a party that you went to or a relationship that once upon a time you had prior to coming to Jesus. It is this unwillingness to completely and permanently disconnect is what Jesus is getting at. And so it's not one of those, oh yeah, I just happened to smell a smell or I saw something on TV that reminded me of some you know, habit that I used to have uh, before God helped me beyond that and into a relationship with him that pleased him. And, and that's how, in a certain sense, that uh, uh, oddly, Genesis 19, and I think it's Luke 9, uh, connect. Isn't that amazing that you can get that kind of clarity after all these years? So, so uh, just to say, like, uh, Jesus is always talking about where your heart is, where your heart is. Yes. This is a whole art, heart issue mm. with yeah. Lot's wife. Yeah, yeah it's not an eye issue. It's a yearning. heart issue. Yeah, a couple sure. more uh, here. Let's see. Uh, uh, yeah. Easy question. Um, how is the land, what process occurs so that the land is cleansed of this salt? Does it slowly leach out of the soil or is it replaced by another layer from erosion from continents elsewhere? And Probably would be a little bit of both, but um, depending on how saline uh, soil becomes will determine how long it takes with rainwater, uh, with um, uh, seasonal flooding, and with erosion that brings in topsoil from other places. So I would say it probably be an, uh, not being that expert in that. I'd say it was a combination of all of the uh, above. Okay, back here. And the angels had told Lot that they couldn't destroy the city until he was, had left. And it says that the sun had risen on Zoar. Is that how you say the town? Mm -hmm. How far is that? Do you know, or do we know, from Sodom? Z the location of Zohar is also uh, disputed, but it's thought, most maps are going to put it at the opposite end, the southern end of the Dead Sea. By the way, there's a gigantic destruction down there, and that's where people have traditionally thought to locate um, Sodom, because there's a place called Babadra, where there are well over a million um, uh, skeletons or skeletal remains. So this area, as desolate as it looks today, 
was evidently a completely different ecological system in, um, uh, in Abraham's day, in the Middle Bronze Age. And the Bible reflects that. I mean, you've got this many people there. There's a reason why, right? They, they're not living out in the middle of nowhere just in order to starve to death. This is a well, it says it was when Lot looked down and he saw that this area was well watered, just like the garden of the Lord. He looked down there and he saw, man, this looks like Eden. This looks like Eden. And he was attracted to that. You know, even the Tower of Babel people, everybody's trying to get to heaven their own way. Yeah. And uh, Jesus had some kind of a statement about, I am, nope. I am the way. Yeah. Question over here. Uh, could this have been the cause of the creation of the Dead Sea? It's by these people, it's thought that the Dead Sea, they, uh, the geologists have a timeline that they say the Dead Sea was created at a certain period of time. They talk about thousands and thousands, 80,000 years ago or something like that. These people think the Dead Sea was already there, that it was very saline. Today it's 34%. When I lived in Israel, when Lacey and I lived in Israel, it was 33%. It's shrunk, you know, uh, so it's increasing in salinity. But that um, it was already there and that this air burst just like shocked the water, pushed it up onto land and dispersed it over uh, approximately five miles to the north and uh, northwest, northeast. Okay, last question. What has the response been? This was published in September in the last couple, three months. What's the response from the scientific community or the theological community? Okay, so um, with the theological, uh, on the theological side, it is uh, these pro guys are probably sensationalists, and we're going to stick with the maps that we've already drawn. So they're digging in on a traditional sort of thing. I've always thought that Sodom was down on the southern end and it was in that area of Zohar or Babadra, where the southern end where, with all those corpses and stuff. But that is early Bronze Age. It's the wrong time period. It's earlier than Abraham. So that's always bothered me a little bit. The, um, the scientific community uh, is kind of digging in at a different location. They're not interested in, well, we drew this map and we put it at this place and we want it to stay there. They're going, well, yeah, there, were, there are lots of other explanations. And I'm going, bring it. You know, I, I, need, to, I need to see it. I need, you know. But this is in Nature, Nature, underlined, italicized, the title of this journal. It is a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And for it to show up at a place like that, not in Biblical Archaeology Review or Westminster Theological Journal or whatever, but to show up in Nature magazine, a peer-reviewed, secular, scientific magazine is absolutely phenomenal. Right. So I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to say 100% this is Sodom. Maybe they'll find a sign. They haven't finished digging. They might be, you know, you know um, <laughs> welcome to Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, <laughs> population 60,000 people or whatever. Uh, but uh, until that time, this, in my view, is now the best candidate by far. I am, again, is this not sensational stuff? Incredible. Have I ever brought this kind of stuff to you before? No, not like this. And so, well, some pretty exciting stuff, but not overly sensationalized. So what you have to understand, those of you that, some of you already know this, Dr. Nunley not only reads and speaks Hebrew, but he also reads and speaks ancient Hebrew. So when he, you're looking back at what's going on here, he's understanding like he gave you the explanation of the, several of the words. And so when this, this scripture comes alive to him like, like no one else, because none of us can do that. Barb, the, I, I said last question, but I can't say no to you. <laughs> okay, what, this, is, this is it though. This, this is it. The prerogative okay. of the queen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real basic question, and you've answered most of it. We've been talked, t told about the Dead Sea, and it's salty. And something attracted Lot to choose this part of the land when he and Abraham stood on the, mm -hmm. the hill looking down. He chose a beautiful territory. So what was this territory like when Lot chose it prior to Sodom and Gomorrah's ending yes and was the water salty then 
And then the, 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 that's question one. And question two is, instead of Sodom and Gomorrah being at the south end, like we've thought, it is really at the north end. Is that what you're telling it's, us? Yeah, instead of the southeast end, uh, Tal el Hamam is on the northeast kind of quadrant end. Uh, all I can give you is that description that, uh, that uh, Exodus 19 gives, and Lot looked and he saw that this area was well watered like the garden of the Lord. So, but even today, you have all kinds of palm groves uh, uh, that are that date palm groves that are being cultivated there. You've seen them yourself. Uh, and so certain plant types are able to endure and even thrive in a more saline kind of context. Uh, the bulrushes is another example. Um, uh, but uh, uh, standard, standard uh, agriculture, like your grains, you know, wheat and barley and that kind of thing, which have been found at Tal El Hammam. So they're growing that stuff. Back in the Middle Bronze Age, before whatever happened happened, they were growing uh, uh, wheat and barley. It's, it's there. It's carbonized. It's in pieces of pottery stuff. It's, it's there, uh, but uh, not for the next 600 years. So we need to be very thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ, for his grace and his mercy, that we're not living in uh, times of Abraham where God had to get people's attention when they came very, very wicked and, and turned perversion and all of that because he had the judge mm. to wake people up to reserve, to reserve righteousness. And so uh, I just wanted to mention that we're going to take a break. Dr. Nunley's giving me the little finger like I want to say one more well, thing. Well, my so last word you... is, and yet, now this is where I want you to do your own translating into your own culture. Uh, God will abide a culture for a long time. He told Abraham with the Canaanites, he said, I'm giving this land to you, but you're not really going to get it for 400 years because the sins of the Amorites have not yet re reached their full measure. Do you remember this? And for 400 years, the mercy in, uh, of God, the, the, the long suffering uh, of patience of God um, endured that um, culture for four centuries. That's like lots longer than the United States has been an independent nation. That would go back to like King James times for us, okay? Um, and uh, yet God's mercy and his patience, his forbearance is not without end. It's not without end. And when he sees that a culture has reached a point or that it's continuing and refusing to turn then, then there's a reset button that gets hit. This reset button got hit, and I'm talking about in a Thor's hammer kind of way, in a major way. Um, I would just hope that you and I would live our lives in a way that we could be, not like the Dead Sea, but salt to our uh, generation, that we could be light to our culture so that we can have the kind of impact that would be a, a turning the battleship back around and back in the direction of God's obedience to his word, loving God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and that maybe this kind of conclusion could be averted. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are the best. All right, we're going to do one more presentation and then a Q&A at the end, and then you're out of here to go Christmas shopping or to watch the Baylor game or whatever you're going to happen to do the rest of the day. Um, this last uh, session that we did, it, it was mostly Old Testament. This one is going to be almost exclusively New Testament. For some of you who have been to us, with, uh, uh, to Israel, with us to Israel, and you, we've done study on the bus and at Nazareth and at Bethlehem and, you know, at night, you know, in evening sessions and stuff like that on the events of the, uh, of the birth of Jesus, connected to the birth of Jesus. Um, some of this may be a little bit of review. However, even for you, I will be filling in blanks. I'll be giving you ancient texts as well as pictures and stuff like that and commentary that you have not heard before. So hopefully that will, that's going to be equally helpful, help, helpful to, uh, to everyone. We're going to ask the question, what, what do we know about Christmas? Maybe um, better, how do we separate out 
uh, historical reality, that which is verifiable from ancient times, um, from those things that have become cultural accretions and additions and legendary stuff. And as we grow as human beings, you and I both know that we had a time period in our lives where we believed in things like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and um, I don't know if you were into Charlie Brown or whatever, but the great pumpkin that rises out of the pumpkin patch, remember? Um, uh, and, then the, and, and then there was a developmental t point at which we began to realize, well, you know what? Um, there is a, a declaration of independence. There was a civil war. Uh, there was a, um, a, a, a time when the King James Bible, there were Puritans and pilgrims and, you know, but Santa Claus, that's mom and dad, right? Okay, hopefully not too young. Anyway, we, um, we get to this developmental stage. And uh, I think that it's helpful for us as Christians to know the difference in terms of our own kind of sacred history. So, you can't get much further than Christian art or artistic depictions of what the birth of Jesus looked like before you come to realize, and you realize it really quickly, different people visualize this, conceptualize this, come from a different you know, theological tradition or whatever in very fundamentally different ways. So, for example, here you have a freestanding shed or uh, barn or whatever. Um, you have angels. Uh, you have a mixture of wise men and shepherds. Here's a wise man, and then here's a shepherd with his shepherd staff. And you've got animals who obviously could all talk, you know, but only that one night out of the year. I think it's something that happens in the larynx. Um, and then you have another um, depiction where Joseph and Mary are there and there aren't any wise men and there aren't any angels and not even the little drummer boy in the corner. But this is a cave kind of an area. This is a naturally occurring rounded cave. Uh, both of these can't be right, can they? Or can they? All right, so there's, there's the presentation, and we're going to address this kind of topically as it shows up mostly in the, some in Matthew, but mostly in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. So just a couple of words on the census. Um, it says that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken. Uh, King James, that all the world should be taxed. You remember Linus with his book Banky and the, you know, the, the, the spotlight that's only on him and Charlie Brown's Christmas. A census should be taken of the inhabited earth, probably more like better translated the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. So Luke does his Luke thing and he's dialing in chronologically to specific indicators within the world of Roman politics. And all the world and all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee, from Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register, part of the census thing, along with Mary, who was engaged, actually that's the NASB, a better translation is betrothed, and they don't mean the same thing, um, and was with child. Joseph... Josephus tells us in his book, Antiquities of the Jews. Josephus gives us about 10 volumes. He's a first century Jew living in the land of Israel who wrote in the same Greek that the New Testament was originally written in and was a contemporary of the apostles. He's writing at the same time the New Testament books, gospels are being written. So he's a very important source. He said that Archelaus, a son of Herod the Great, his territory was added to the province of Syria, and Cyrenius, that's just another spelling of Quirinius that we have in Luke's gospel, was sent by Caesar to take an account of the people's property. 
Okay, so this is not an income tax, nor is it simply a census like we do in our day where someone comes to our door and takes down some numbers, no money's exchanged and they are just counting heads that will affect things like government funding and um, how many representatives you get in the House of Representatives and stuff like that, various voting districts, no money involved. This is all about money and it's all about property. He also says that uh, Cyrenius or Quirinius came at this time to Syria. He was sent by Caesar, this is Augustus Caesar, to take an account of their substance. He's being even more specific in the next book, in book 18. A taxation, okay, this is not just counting nickels and noses, this is about money changing hands. So they gave an account of, look at this, their estates. This is all about property tax. Evidently then, Joseph uh, owned property in Bethlehem and for that reason had to leave Nazareth in Galilee and go to Bethlehem, which is south of Jerusalem. So Roman rule in the land of Israel. Just talk about that for a moment. The Romans had been in charge of, engaged in a military occupation of the land of Israel since 63 B.C., that means that by the time of the ministry of Jesus, the Romans had been there for a hundred years plus. A long, long time. And they were entrenched. And they were not simply um, uh, benevolent dictators. They were um, heavy-handed, occupational, military-oriented, the Roman governor, like Pontius Pilate and the other 11 that were dispatched from Rome, were not elected by the people. They were military governors, and they were there primarily to, to oversee a military occupation. The people of Israel were heavily taxed, and the average lifespan of an adult male in the land of Israel, if you were Jewish, was 53. That's the average age. Is that because of famine? No. Is that because of lack of proper medical attention? No. It was due primarily to a certain mode of execution that I think you've read about in the Bible before. Crucifixion. The Assyrians started it in the 9th century B.C. They handed it down to the Babylonians, to the Persians, to the Greeks, and the Greeks handed it off to the Romans who perfected crucifixion. And just in the writings of our now old friend Josephus, you hear instances that he records in his books of history where, more, that where thousands of people are crucified at one time. At one time. For example, he talks about uh, the, um, uh, the end of the uh, revolt of, uh, of Spartacus. And he says that there were crosses end to end on both sides of the road on the Appian Way from Capua all the way to the capital city of Rome, miles and miles. He talks about his own Jerusalem where he was born and raised. And he says, on the eve of the, um, uh, of the uh, breaching of the walls and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in A.D. 70, and he was an eyewitness to this. He's recording it as an eyewitness. He says that there were so many crucifixion victims that the Roman soldiers who were crucifying people who were trying to escape or uh, other prisoners and that kind of thing, there were so many crosses that they couldn't find places to put other crosses all around the city of Jerusalem. So this is the nature of Roman occupation. These were not good times. Consequently, in hard times, you start looking to better days in the future. For Jews who had the Old Testament and the prophecies and that kind of thing, this meant a very fervent expectation that a messianic figure would come and would deliver them, not from their sin, you go to the temple, you sacrifice to deal with a sin problem. But the common expectation of Jews in that day was to deliver us from our enemies and all others that want to oppress us. 
Herod the Great was a big part of this Roman rule in the land of Israel. He would rise to power some 40 years before the birth of Jesus and, and, and change. So in, in, in uh, 40 BC, uh, he was rising to power and there was a revolt against him that almost took his life. It was led by Mattathias Antigonus, who was the, 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 the last remaining male heir of the Maccabees, Judah Maccabee, Simon Maccabee, etc., who had brought independence to Israel for a hundred years, ended in 63 BC when the Romans came in. So now Rome is looking for people to serve as proxy uh, leaders, to represent them to the people. Uh, indigenous people that they could raise up and trust. So they began to trust Herod the Great. But Herod was kicked out of his own country in 40 BC. By the time of, uh, of 37 BC, he was in Rome and he was um, lobbying the Roman Senate and finally got to get, uh, 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 was able to um, persuade them to proclaim him King of the Jews. He's the only person who ever had that, that title until a baby was born. And some wise men came to town and they were asking, where is he who has been not appointed, not put in place by the Romans, but born king of the Jews? And it says, and Herod was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Herod was paranoid. Um, he was a genius but he was unbelievably, according to Josephus, unbelievably cruel to the extent that he killed all 10 of his wives and most of his kids because he thought that they were plotting against him or he was jealous of them or some sort of thing. So he was, yeah, he was kind of like the mad scientist or whatever. He, incredible builder, incredible intellect, but we would probably say paranoid schizophrenic incredibly mentally ill at least unstable socially even with his own family he was cruel to everyone around him says Josephus so that's the Herod the Great that we've come to know and love and need to read into the gospel accounts Josephus is full of stories about Herod the Great how one time for example on his deathbed he said when I die everybody's going to rejoice and I don't want that I want the whole country to go in mourning. So, soldiers, round up the 800 leading religious leaders of the Jewish people and put them in a stadium in Jericho. That's where he was trying to rehabilitate. And he uh, said, when I die, put all of them to death so that the entire country will go into mourning and won't rejoice over much at my death. That's the kind of Herod that we read about killing the babies in Bethlehem current messianic hopes what I would like to do in this quick section is look at some of the earliest stuff from the rabbis from before during and just after the time of Jesus and we're going to survey this really quickly I'm not even going to give you the references because they're up at the top of the screen they're there but I want to look at the underlined portions the king messiah that already tells you son Melech HaMashiach, the king messiah um, is already telling you this guy is not the suffering servant. He's not the, the, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's a conquering king that's going to come in and take charge. And boy, is he going to take care of business. He's going to draw near to kingship. He's going to be associated with royalty. You know, Jesus never really pulled any of those punches, right? Hey, I'm the son of David. He never even refers to himself as son of David. Not once. Other people call him that. But he talks about himself as son of man, etc. Okay, so the quote is from, uh, the, uh, from, Isaac, from Zechariah 14. I will gather all of the nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's what this king is going to be engaged in doing. And he's going to smite the land with the rod of his mouth, quoting the book of Isaiah. All right, now, is this true? Is Zechariah and Isaiah right? Yes, but Jesus, when he's here, he says... First coming activity, I deal with sin. I deal with the sin problem. I deal with the heart issue of human beings. The kingdom of heaven is within you. It's the second coming where he accords all of this other stuff. And the day of the vengeance of our God, he leaves for the second coming. Okay? Another. 
The staff of Aaron was held in the hand of every king, and it, the same staff, is going to be held in the hand of the King Messiah. The Lord was going to, Psalm 110, is going to stretch forth from Zion your mighty staff. May you rule in the midst of your enemies. It's putting the enemies, and then that they're looking at every knee bow and every tongue confess at that time. First coming, first appearance, only appearance of the Messiah. People are going to bring gifts, tribute to this Messiah. All the kings of the earth will prostrate themselves before him, Psalm 72. Does that happen in Jesus' life and ministry? No. This is as he would understand it, and as the New Testament unfolds, we understand that this stuff is going to happen at the end of human history, in the second coming. The King Messiah, 1 Samuel chapter 2, he will give power to his king and victory to his anointed one. They're quoting the right passages, but they get the timing mixed up. First and second coming by the rabbis and by everybody in that time. It's all telescoped into one event. The King Messiah and David are going to rule in tandem like an emperor and a viceroy. Do you ever get that in Jesus' life and ministry? First coming? Never. The Messiah is going to be king, and David is going to be second in command. He's going to be the number two guy. He is going to be just and victorious. This has to do with the coming of the Messiah. The Messianic age will result in servitude of foreign kingdoms, and they will leave the land of Israel. Flee from Edom, which becomes a code word for the rabbis, both Edom and Esau, um, for the, uh, the empire of Rome. So what are the focuses, the foci of messianic expectation in the first century? It is ethnocentric. It's about a redemption of the Jewish people, not universal. It is the focus of, of these teachings, it's, it's, and popular belief and opinion, is that it's primarily the kingdom of God is, is external, it's outside, it's physical, not internal, not spiritual. It's temporal, it's in time, it's not an eternal kingdom. It's nationalistic, you know, the whole nation is going to be saved, redeemed, delivered, as opposed to we all stand before God one-on-one. -on -one. It's not individual salvation, it's a national salvation. And it's a victory over physical enemies, not a victory over the enemy, the adversary, or victory over sin. Okay, now the time of Jesus' birth. Luke says, and he's very specific about this, it came about that while they were there, what we get in, you know, Christmas cantatas or in the depictions that we get in movies made by Hollyweird is that as, as Joseph and Mary cruised into the, um, onto the, the city limit of Bethlehem in, in that Middle Eastern Cadillac, the donkey or, or, or a camel, that it was, it was at that very moment that the final contraction hit Mary and Jesus was born like right away, right on arrival. Now Luke says, while they were there, suggesting that there was a time lapse between arrival and birth. Um, we get a amplified version of this in a book called the Protevangelum of James. It comes from the early second century AD. It's about a generation after the gospels were written. In chapter 17 of that book, it's not in the Bible, you can find it online. Just Google this and you can read the whole thing if you want, even while you're here, if I get boring. It says that Joseph saddled the donkey. That's the first time that we hear about a donkey in all of Christian history. It's not in Luke. It's not in Matthew. It's not in the other Gospels. It's not anywhere until the Proto-Evangelum of James, around 120 A.D., 120, 130 A.D., 
I had a a student in a Sunday school class. I I raised the question. It was a rhetorical, intended to be a rhetorical question. So besides that, a donkey is an expensive animal, and a donkey is also expensive to maintain. A carpenter, Joseph, would have no need of a donkey. Now, if he was moonlighting as a farmer, he might need a donkey or something like that to plow with. But carpenters don't need animals that are used for bearing burdens and for, you know, plowing soil and that kind of thing. So I'm not even sure why, why Joseph would, where he would even get a donkey and someone at the, at the, shouldn't have gone there, somebody at the back said, I know he was a really good man and he had great relationships with his neighbors and he borrowed one from one of his neighbors. I went, okay, we just solved the problem that wasn't there, but great, so be it. So they drew near to Bethlehem within three miles, it says. See the underlying portion? And that's um, kind of where we're getting, starting to get this idea that right on the entry to Bethlehem was the, the birth of Jesus took place. How long were they there? I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but more than likely, it was a matter of days, possibly weeks. Take me down from the donkey, um, which is pressing me to come out. This is still the proto-evangelum of James. So he took her down from the donkey, um, and there he found a cave. This is in chapter 18, verse 1. He found a cave. Remember the two different pictures at the beginning, one of a freestanding stable, the other of Mary Joseph and the birth in a cave. He found a cave. So this is one of the earliest references um, to uh, the birth of Jesus as being in a cave. Now, so let's address the issue of the stable, if that's okay. Uh, She gave birth to her firstborn and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. It comes from the French word, the French verb manger, which means to eat. We get the word, I think, English. It's kind of a a slang word, munch. It's sort of the same derivation. Manger, to munch, to eat. It is a feeding trough for animals. From that one word, then, we have built up the idea of the freestanding barn or stable with all kinds of animals around and other accoutrements um, because of the presence of a manger. So here's the picture, and there you see uh, the, um, the manger in the, um, with the made of wood and the straw and the baby Jesus in it, uh, the church of the nativity. The Church of the Nativity um, is in Bethlehem, and we visit it when we go to, uh, go to Israel. And here's a picture of it from above. It's built in the form of a cross. It goes back to um, the days of, uh, I think it's 327 or something like that, the days of Constantine and his mother Helena, who was charged with building these kinds of churches. So it's built in the form of sort of a Byzantine cross. Okay. Uh, Here's the plaza in front of the Church of the Nativity. Uh, Here you see the little tiny, you have to bend over to get through it, the little tiny entryway. Um, And then there's a close-up of the same with the man who has to bend over. Usually when um, the discussion of um, Jesus saying uh, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom, uh, uh, it's harder for a camel It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom. Um, This is the picture that's shown. The problem is that this is not the wall of Jerusalem. This is the the church of the nativity in Bethlehem. Other than that, it's a great theory. Here's inside the church. Um, It is a a beautiful, most of these are uh, medieval ruins that sit on uh, the bases of those um, Byzantine or late Roman uh, ruins built by the uh, mother of Constantine, Queen Helena. Uh, and at the, at the very end of this hall, you see there the altar area. And underneath the altar, you go down by a series of steps. You don't usually see it this clean, do you? There's usually a mob, you know, a, that, that's attacking that one little skinny entrance. So you can go down into this area that is well lit, um, and you see a marble floor there, and this is underneath the altar. It's under the existing uh, church and is a part of that cave complex. Here's a picture of the same, and this is the birth area with the little uh, gold star right here that's marking the spot of the download. Um, that occurred uh, 2,000 years ago. 
beautiful. Uh, we get the protoevangelium of James that mentions a cave, and we also hear about early church fathers. And we're talking about way before there was anything called Catholic Church or whatever. Look at Justin Martyr's years. He was born in A.D. 100. He lived 65 years. Justin Martyr says that Joseph took up his quarters in a certain cave. We also hear about Origen, who was the bishop of Caesarea, but before that he came from Alexandria, and he says, in Bethlehem there's a cave that's pointed out where he was born. The manger in the cave where he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and the rumor in those places is that um, uh, among foreigners of the faith that indeed Jesus was born in this cave. So even unbelievers are pointing to a specific location in Bethlehem that was a cave that is worshipped and reverenced by Christians. Okay, in, in the works of the early rabbis, the rabbis say that natural rock prevents the spread of ritual impurity. A man-made stone wall will not prevent the spread of ritual impurity, say from touching a corpse or uh, from touching a leper or um, uh, a woman in her uh, time of ritual impurity, um, but that overhang, and so overhanging crags, rocks, and it specifically mentions caves do prevent the spread of ritual impurity. And then the word tent is basically used here as a human, a dwelling for human beings. And it says that the rules of ritual impurity don't apply to cliffs and overhanging rocks. So the rabbis had already decided that you could prevent the spread of ritual impurity by having that source of ritual impurity be in a naturally occurring cave or crag or cleft of a rock. In the land of, uh, of Israel, and specifically in the Judean hill country, this is from uh, Nebi Samuel or Mizpah, um, we have excavations, and these are recent excavations, ones that you guys who have been to Israel have not seen yet, uh, that these are first century homes, and you can see where there's naturally, uh, that where there's human constructed uh, walls, and then naturally occurring rock. This is bedrock right here. And you have a room inside of there. So there's a home that's been built on top of a naturally occurring cave. What would those caves be used for? Storage, kind of like a root cellar because it stays at a, somewhere between 50 and 60 degrees, pretty much constant. Um, for the um, uh, protection of small animals, maybe sheep, goats, dogs, cats, whatever, I don't know, but, you know, something that would produce heat that would then rise and actually help to, um, uh, to warm the, the home in the wintertime. Um, but it's a multi-storage, multi-use kind of situation. Here's yet another one, and you can see the, the, ma the man-made wall, but then you can also see bedrock and where a naturally occurring cave has been enhanced by human activity. And there's a, actually a room underneath the regular home that's going to be up in this area here that's sitting on top of a naturally occurring uh, depression or cave. Here's a great example right here, uh, a very good example. So you have man-made uh, wall here, and then from here down is bedrock with the door, with windows, all kinds of stuff. So you could have people up in the home and a birth that takes place in the cave, these people involved in the birth would be ritually impure by virtue of childbirth. Leviticus 12 says, for a male child, ritual impurity for 40 days. For the birth of a female child, 80 days. It's double the time. Uh, and they didn't have ultrasound. They didn't know what, you know, they, they weren't there when Gabriel said to Mary, you're going to have a son and you're going to name him Jesus. So they didn't have ultrasounds either. And so they go, how, how, would you, uh, how would you feel about coming into this home here and then making everyone ritually impure for three months? We couldn't go to work. We couldn't go to the synagogue. We couldn't go to the temple. We couldn't, couldn't touch a Levite or a priest. We couldn't handle a Torah scroll. We couldn't even exchange money with someone else. In that sense, it's a little bit worse than COVID. 
So this is the reason why at the very beginning of this presentation, I gave you one artist's depiction of the event occurring in a cave. Okay, let's talk about the manger for a moment. She gave birth. What we're trying to do is to help you take steps closer to the original event of the birth of Jesus that was real history. This is not myth or legend or bedtime stories or fairy tales, kids' fables, you know, that kind of thing. This is the sort of stuff that I'm hoping that gets underneath your fingernails that you can touch. It's part of our... Uh, the, the reality of our human existence. So Luke chapter 2, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths or swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. So again, here we have the wooden manger constructed like that. And yet in Israel, what we find is that mangers are made of stone. Joseph as a carpenter, the word tectone actually can mean stone worker, a stone mason a worker of stone. Um, and probably I would say that Joseph made uh, any number of mangers in his lifetime. Okay, so this is made of basalt rock. It's made of um, volcanic rock. And this one you may have seen, some of you may have seen at Chorazin, one of the locations where Jesus preached and taught. Chorazin, it's like 45 minute hike straight north of Capernaum, straight up that drainage system. It's just above the Sea of Galilee. Here's a picture of the same, and there you can see where someone has chiseled a drain hole right there in case it rained. If this was presumably outside, used outside, and if it got full of water, then whatever was in it would get soggy, so they've allowed for a drain hole so that their animals' food didn't get soggy. I think that's sweet, don't you? Here's a picture of another one, and this one is from Megiddo on the western end of the Jezreel Valley. Here's another one that I find particularly compelling because you have here as well as here rocks that have been had a hole hewn through them so for tethering animals while they so they won't wander off after they have eaten their full at this manger. Here's one at um, uh, Katsurin. Uh, have, you, have you guys ever been to Katsurin? It's up in the Golan Heights. Any of you guys ever been to, well, we needed to go there next time. It's a, it's a village from around the time of Jesus just before that's been completely reconstructed. You don't even have to use your imagination. It's got upper rooms. It's got, got a, a, a place for uh, processing olive oil, all kinds of cool stuff at Katsreen. It's, it's sort of like a biblical Dollywood. It's really neat, but one of those discoveries there is is a, is a, a stone um, manger. The shepherds and the wise men, we'll talk about those guys for a little bit. You have, for example, shepherds over here, uh, or wise men. The shepherds, I think, are busy. They're taking care of their sheep, keeping watch over their flock by day. Luke says, today in the city of David, there's been born for you, and this is the shepherds. The shepherds are in Luke, the wise men are in Matthew. Today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior, Christ Jesus, Christ the Lord. Um, so they, they came in haste and found the, the Mary and Joseph. In other words, they got there that night. The same night of the birth, of the time of the birth, that's when the, the shepherds arrive. Also, in verses 12 and 16, this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby, and the Greek word is brephos. I've given you that in English transliteration, and that means suckling infant, a newborn baby, a newborn, okay? That's important, and this is in the gospel of, help me out here, Luke, okay? Also in verse 16, and the baby, the brephos, lying in a manger, okay? That's Luke. Jesus at this stage of his existence as a human being on this earth is an, a newborn infant, a suckling infant. When we get to the Gospel of Matthew, though, we get a little bit different situation. Look at the details. Magi who are from the east, how far from the east? I don't know. The next civilization you get to is, uh, is Persia, Medo-Persia, Iran-Iraq today, um, Parthi the Parthian Empire in, in Roman times. 
So these guys have traveled a few miles. It's taken them a while. They're not getting there the same day or night of Jesus' birth. So Herod called the, the Magi. I'm going to suggest Magoi is the Greek word, and that these are not pagan astrologers. They never repent. They never renounce their use of the pagan arts. Uh, they, they, they don't confess Jesus and ask for forgiveness, you know, for these kind of the magic uh, or, uh, use of, of magic arts and astrology and that kind of thing. Um, I, the word magoi gives us the word magistrate or magnificent, that kind of thing. It's M-A-G, right? It's both Greek and Latin, and it means great ones. I wrote uh, half of a book um, uh, that you might be able to find somewhere, I don't know. But anyway, um, that uh, suggests that these are exalted leaders, representatives of the Jewish community, the 90% of Judaism that stayed in exile voluntarily when Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, and Sheshbazar were bringing only 10% back from Babylonian exile. Um, it's just a thought, it's just a suggestion. He checks, Herod checks with these magoi and ascertains from them the time that the star appeared. So it's all about the timing of the appearance of the star and how long it took them to get to the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and then Bethlehem. It says he sent them to Bethlehem and says, make careful search for the child. And it's not Luke's brephos. Instead, this is Matthew's paideu. Paideu. It comes from the word P-E-D. It's where we get the word podiatrist, pediatrics. It has to do with children, people who are capable of moving around by their legs. So by the time that the magi or the magoi, the, the wise men, get to Bethlehem, Jesus is a toddler. He's not sucking at the breast. He's not crawling around. He's moving about using his feet. His pedoi, paideon. And it says in verse 11, they came into the house, not the barn, not the stable, not the cave. And my suggestion is a very simple one, and that is, well, obviously, if it's a year and a half later, do you think a woman, Mary, would put up with a husband, Joseph, who was a carpenter, he was a builder, still living in a cave a year and a half later? Survey says... Absolutely not. By this point, he'd gotten his backsides outside, built them a home, and now they've got a place where they can sh uh, hang their shingle, get their mail, and take care of living. Um, in verse 16, and this is also important, when Herod kills the babies, actually it's the toddlers. It's from two years old and under. He probably exaggerates probably rounds up from about a year and a half to two years to make sure that he gets Jesus. Thankfully, he didn't. God intervened, and he brought deliverance, just like he does in our lives. And by the time these guys get there, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus are on their way to, 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 to uh, Egypt. Another story for another time. Two years under, uh, and how did he determine this time? according to the time that he ascertained from these magoi, these wise men or representatives of the Jewish community or whatever you want to, however you want to uh, identify them. So again, we're back to our two depictions, the ones at the beginning of the uh, discussion, the second discussion. And what I'm wondering is um, uh, if we have wise men here, but we also have shepherds. These two visits are separated by a year and a half. My thought is that the wise men and the shepherds not, never saw each other. They were not there at the same time. When the shepherds come, they're in the cave. When the wise men come, they're in a home. Jesus is a suckling infant in Luke's version. He is a toddler moving around by the locomotion of the feet in Matthew's. Two completely de different developmental stages of the human life cycle, right? We've all experienced both of those. Might not remember them, but we, we went through it. 
Somewhere back there hundreds of years ago, we went through it. Um, also, uh, not only are the, the shepherds and wise men not there at the same time, if the shepherds are there, it, it, uh, regardless, the angels, the angels are usually there in our modern depictions of the birth of Jesus. The angels appeared to the shepherds out in the field before they came. So then what are we doing here, like here or on the screen? We are telescoping time and space. We have to do this. We've got to get the whole movie in in one setting. The whole birth event, both Luke's version and, and Matthew's version, in one setting for one cantata. Do you ever do a Christmas cantata part one and then part two? No. You know, like a year and a half later, we come back, hey, let's do Matthew's version this time. No, nope, doesn't happen. I've never seen anything like that. We have this reinforced then by the Christmas books that we read to our kids and then also by Hollyweird and they do their own versions of this and everything, time and space are telescoped all into one and that's not unique to the Christmas event. We do this kind of thing all the time, telescoping time. Um, the star, I think that this is important for us to discuss if for no other reason than prophecy fulfillment. The wise men ask this question. Again, wise men are only in Matthew. Where is he who has been born? We talked about that already, king of the Jews. We saw his star, not a star, his star. It's a star that's specifically associated with the appearance of a great Jewish king. We saw his, his star in the east come to worship him. Then Herod, notice that Herod does this secretly. Verse seven in Matthew two is a sidebar conversation. He doesn't allow his courtiers, he doesn't allow the, the leadership in the Sanhedrin or the Jewish leaders to listen to this part of the discussion. He called them aside secretly and he ascertained from them the time that the star appeared. This would become important to determine what his decree for death would be two years and old and under when we get to verse 16. And having heard the king, they went their way and the star that they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the child, again, that's that word paideon, um, one moving about by the locomotion of the feet, where the child was. Now, this is going to tell us uh, that, I, in my opinion, that this star cannot be because it comes to rest right over the place where the home where that, that Joseph had built for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus in Bethlehem. It came to it, it stopped. It, it, it guided them to that specific home and then stayed there. You know, like X marks the spot. You know, right that that. that little blue kind of bubble, sort of looks like a hot air balloon that you get on your Google map when you're riding down the road. That's what this is doing. It's, it can't then be some um, constellation. It can't be an alignment, a, a, a planetary alignment of like, say, for example, Saturn, Neptune, and, and, um, and Mars or Venus. Um, most scholars have looked for the Bethlehem star as one of those things, some sort of a constellation or some sort of a, a inter interplanetary alignment. It doesn't look like to me that Matthew's describing that kind of star. Okay, was it Halley's Comet? I don't know. Was it some other thing that we've been able to uh, identify? I don't know about that either. This looks like to me um, something that's unique not repeatable, and that probably is not going to show up in the astronomical record, in the Chinese records, or in the medieval records, or, you know, anywhere else. Um, so my thought is we're just kind of on our own on this one. Uh, I don't think that the science and the way that people have tried to identify it in the scientific community, the astronomical community, are, I don't know that the answer is going to be found there. Uh, I do know, looking backward though, if you read your New Testament, you read your New Testament with your eye in the rearview mirror. What happened here like this before? Who said something like this before? And what we get is in Numbers 24, I see him, but not now. This is in the visionary future. I behold him, but not near. This is happening back in the days of Moses. This is 1400 BC. This is 
a millennium and a half before Jesus would be born. So it's not near and it's not now. A star will come forth from Jacob and a scepter will rise from Israel and will crush the heads of the afflictors of the Israelite slash Jewish people. Um, this, I think, is the only passage that the wise men could have been pointing to or had their attention attracted by to connect the birth of a great Jewish leader with the appearance of a star. So you can play around with that a little bit on your own. I give it to you as homework. I get to do this because I'm still a professor, taught three classes this past summer, and uh, have fun with it. Uh, the inn. Um, she gave birth to her firstborn son, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the bottom of the screen in the inn. Interesting though, though, as popular as this is, it got into the English translation tradition prior to the King James Bible in 1611. It was in the Bishop's Bible, it was in the Geneva Bible, it was in the Open Bible, all preceding the King James. So there's already a hundred plus year translation tradition when the King James comes online and it's always been in. So nobody's going to change that, but the word doesn't mean in. We, 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 we know the word, the Greek word in, you know, like is in motel or hotel, it's pondexion. Now you look at this word over up here, I've written it in English letters, is that pondexion? No, it's not. So what is kataluma? It, it is, um, it has to do with a specifically designated area of a private home. Example, Jesus uses this word in Mark chapter 14. He comes to Jerusalem his last time. He's going to celebrate Passover with his disciples. He says to two of his disciples, I want you to go and find a man carrying a jar of water. And wherever he goes in, say to the land, to the house, uh, the, the head of the house, uh, where is my kataluma? Where is my guest room? That's the way it's translated, even in King James. So how did it happen? I don't know. I wasn't there. Jeez, 400 years ago. Um, so um, this is evidently what we're looking at. You go from the top floor up a ladder or some series of steps into an upper room, a kataluma. That's what Jesus is talking about in Mark 14. Here's what it looks like. This is all at Katsreen. Guys, you got to see this. This is, this is biblical Dollywood. This is amazing. Pigeon Forge. This is so, uh, Steal Your Dollar City or whatever they call it. Um, did you guys go there when you were in Branson? Yes or no? Yes. Ah, oh, wow. Is it, is it Silver Dollar City or is it Steal Your Dollar City? I don't mean to take their name in vain or anything like that. Okay, so what we're talking about then is that when Jesus made his heavenly decision and decree that he was going to change places and he was going to change formats, and he was going to take on human flesh, he laid aside some of this glory and, you know, foreknowledge and stuff like that, and he became like one of us. He knew this was going to happen. He knew ahead of time that he was going to be despised and rejected the Gospel of John says he came to his own. The, the Greek word, word hediot, um, uh, and in Hebrew, the Hebrew took it over from the Greek, means a specific personal individual. He came to his own, you know, like an individual family member. Forget about Motel 6. It didn't happen. Bethlehem and Jerusalem are too close together for it to be the next pit stop. Caravan stops are every 20 miles. We know this because we've got the written records. We've got the archaeology. Caravan is every 20 miles. The next 20-mile stop is not Bethlehem, is it? It's Hebron, 15 miles further to the south. So it's Jerusalem is a caravan stop, and the next one is Hebron. So there's no need for hotels and motels. Nobody stops in Bethlehem. In fact, the road went past it. It bypassed Bethlehem. Bethlehem is off to the east from the, where, the, where the main road runs. We, we take it on buses when we go from Jerusalem to Hebron. And you see Bethlehem off, way off the road, off to the left, 
on the very edge of the Judean hill country and the Judean wilderness, the desert area, right? And so um, when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, all of the indications that we have from ancient literature, from archaeology, from um, ancient culture, the history that we have, even from the New Testament and the way that words, uh, what words mean, um, is that Jesus and his family were not rejected by some businessman who thought he could gouge somebody else for more shekels or didn't want his place to be all dirtied up by a human birth or whatever. He was rejected by people in a private dwelling, a home, a family dwelling. Would they have knocked on the doors of folks that they didn't know, total strangers, then who was Jesus when it says in John, he came, into his, came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. What is this talking about? Family, exactly. And Jesus knew this. You know why Jesus did this? Yes, he knew there would be suffering. He knew there would be rejection. He even, I think, foreknew that there would be rejection by his members of his own family. Never mind that there was issues about the origin of the pregnancy and stuff like that. This is the way that Jesus was treated from, the, from his first breaths. Why would he have done something like that? What would have been worth that kind of ostracization, that kind of rejection? Why did he do that? Who did he do that for? Who? Yes. Me. You. Man, that's... This is the love of God. Not that we loved him first, but that he loved us first. That's this God in pursuit of you and me. He's willing to go to those kinds of lengths. I don't want war in my own family. I don't want this kind of you know, radical separation between me and anybody else in my family. But the God who created this world and created you and me was willing to go through that kind of ostracizing, that kind of stigma, that kind of rejection because he loves you and me that much.